Hello, and welcome to Books in the World, a production of Cape Cod Writers' Center. I'm your host, Kathleen Murphy. Books in the World is an interview show produced by the Cape Cod Writers' Center and the Cape Media Center. Our goal is to show how writers, illustrators, publishers, editors, and others in the literary field play their roles in the world of books and other communication media. The Writers' Center was established 58 years ago and sponsors a four-day annual writers' conference every summer, right here on Cape Cod. Books in the World has been broadcasting continuously for over four decades. Today, we are delighted to welcome Don Wilding, author of the book, Shipwrecks of Cape Cod, Stories of Tragedy and Triumph. There's some really surprising Cape Cod history revealed in this book. I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for being here, Don. Thanks for having me, Kathleen. I'd like to share your background with our audience first, and then we'll get into your book. Since the start of the millennium, Don Wilding has been telling stories of Cape Cod outer beach history through lectures, videos, and the written word. Don is the author of three books on Cape Cod history, Henry Beston's Cape Cod, A Brief History of East Ham, and this latest book, Shipwrecks of Cape Cod. His fourth book, Cape Cod and the Great Gale of 1898, is scheduled to be published in spring 2023. Don has worked as a Cape Cod tour guide and is a regular speaker on Cape Cod lore in Massachusetts and across New England. For 36 years, he was an award-winning newspaper editor, writer, and designer in Massachusetts, including a recent stint as a contributing history columnist and photographer for our Cape Cod newspapers. Don has also been an instructor of Cape Cod history courses for the University of, excuse me, the Open University of Wellfleet and Nauset Community Education. And your book is quite an education. You feature about 40 shipwrecks here, most of them along the easternmost shore of Cape Cod. The first you describe happened in 1626, only about six years after the Pilgrims landed in Plymouth. And the last was in 1984. So your featured shipwrecks span over 350 years of history. American history, certainly, but also because of the extensive trade along our Atlantic seaboard, you tell stories of ships and shipmates from all over the world. I'm looking forward to talking with you about them over the next 25 minutes or so. So my first question, John, is when you started writing about Cape Cod shipwrecks, did you know that there had been so many? I knew there were a lot. I just wasn't aware of the number being as, as high as it was. Um, <clears throat> there was between 1626 or the early 1600s and the mid 20th century, uh, there was somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 shipwrecks along Cape, Cod, Cape Cod's Outer Beach. And to me, that number was staggering. Uh, there's, there's an old saying that if you could raise all of the ships that you know, all these shipwrecks up uh, between, um, you know, uh, along the Outer Beach, you could walk from Provincetown to Chatham without getting your feet wet. Wow. Yeah. Um, of course, most of the shipwrecks occurred in winter months with March being especially bad. Uh, can you describe then what the perils were that ship, a ship's crew might face if they struck a sandbar or a rock on the, on the outer Cape? That's something I don't think a lot of people realize when what happened with shipwrecks, especially along Cape Cod. You're, you're not going to strike a lot of rocks so much as you would in some other places like along Maine's coast or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, when you hit the sandbar in one of these old wooden masted ships um, during that time frame, it's not just like you're getting stuck in the sand. You, you know, it would, it would start to, it was like a crash. You would be, the, the ship would hit the bar in a storm usually. So they were being driven off course to begin with. And usually these were prevailing winds were out of the Northeast. So that would drive the ships right into the shoreline and the shoals around Cape Cod and the sandbars are just, they extend out to a mile in some places, uh, particularly off Provincetown and off Monomoy. Uh, these were particularly treacherous areas. 
So whenever that happened, it would the ship would start breaking apart and take on water perhaps. And it was also on these sandbars where the waves were breaking. So the waves would start to break it apart. Men would often have to climb up into the masts of these ships for any hope of survival and hope that somebody comes along and saves them at yeah. that point. So yeah. when, when you're in that situation, it's, it's really, uh, you're hoping for the best. And usually uh, a lot of times help didn't get there in time and the masts would just collapse and that would be the end of it. Right. Uh, but often uh, thanks to the life-saving service and the Coast Guard, yeah. they were able to save quite a few lives. Yeah, yeah, so let's get into that. So you describe the rescue efforts and the way that you, are, um, you present the shipwrecks, you're presenting them in chronological order. So we can see how the rescue services you know, improved over time. So it's a great history lesson. So what were the first organized assistance or what were the first organized services to try to help prevent these shipwrecks? Well, I realized it was a, it was quite a problem uh, during the 1600s and 1700s, and you, again, you just had to hope that somebody was coming along and would would be able to rescue you. Well, that wasn't working out so well. Um, around 1786, it was the Massachusetts Humane Society that was actually in the business of rescuing those in shipwrecks. Yeah. And this, this was mostly a volunteer effort. It was for many years before they even got any kind of government aid for this sort of thing. Mass Humane Society uh, would have uh, set up all these little huts along the, uh, along the Cape and other places in Massachusetts. And with these huts, they would have equipment or whatever else they need. And they would often wheel out a surf boat uh, and this was all volunteers. So they would have to be gathered up whenever a wreck happened and get their act together and uh, get out there. And it really, it saved some lives, but it wasn't nearly enough. Then we got to lighthouses. There, there were other lighthouses, but there weren't any on the outer Cape until 1797. The first lighthouse on the Cape was Highland Light. Benjamin Franklin was the one that came up with the idea to say, hey, we need some lighthouses out here. Um, so with that, Highland was the first one in 1797, and it's not the structure you see out there today. That's actually been through a couple of uh, different reincarnations. They've, uh, after Highland, there were other lighthouses that were built. Uh, you had one light at Highland, and then in 1818, uh, two, two beacons were built at Chatham, so you could tell between the two. And then 1837 is when they constructed the Three Sisters of Nauset at East Ham. And that's where Nauset Light is today. And also Race Point Light was also in the early 19th century. And so they had these lighthouses popping up and that too was of great assistance. Um, it was actually said after the Three Sisters were constructed that the uh, uh, some people who were in the wrecking business, not moon cussers, but the wrecking business were, were actually upset because this affected their business. You know, they went out for a ship, struck the bar and they would go out and help themselves to whatever cargo it was carrying uh, after the people were rescued. Um, but the lighthouses really weren't enough. Is, is that correct? The wrecks kept happening in spite of, in spite of the, the moon cussers uh, disappointment. The wrecks did keep happening. So it, what did the wasn't, it wasn't nearly yeah. enough. Yeah, they uh, it got into the point in the 1800s where um, they had to, the government had to take some action. And there was some more assistance going to the Humane Society, but as they finally decided under, uh, under the government's overseeing, they, they had to establish a new service. And that's where the U.S. Life Saving Service came into, uh, came into being formed. It was uh, under the direction of a fellow named Sumner Kimball. Kimball was a Maine native, but actually as a very young man, he was a teacher. Uh, he taught school in Orleans. So he was quite familiar with the, uh, 
the perils of shipwrecks and what it meant and, and what a problem it was. Uh, so he was the one to set up shop really with the life-saving service, not just here on Cape Cod, but everywhere. Uh, he was overseeing everything. And he was quite the bureaucrat. He knew how to get finance, financial aid and everything that was needed. In fact, he was the first one to retire with a pension. Uh, but Kimball was, uh, he knew he couldn't do this alone. So one of the things he did, he hired a writer, uh, O'Connor was his name, Liam O'Connor. And O'Connor was, uh, was very good at painting the picture, except he would, he would keep the facts, the facts, but uh, he would uh, kind of over elaborate a little bit. So when it came to time, time came to get money from Congress, the financial uh, assistance, this worked out very well. So he took the reports that he got from the keepers of the life-saving service stations, jazzed them, spiced them up a little bit, and yeah, Kimball got his money. And that led to uh, stations being opened everywhere in the 1870s. Nine of them were established on the Outer Cape uh, between Provincetown and Chatham. And that eventually built up to 13 stations by 19, 1902. So between these stations, they had a halfway point. And as I understand right. it, in the winter months, fall and winter months and early spring, you had uh, the servicemen that were traveling from the station to the halfway point. Is that right? And then they were meeting and they had a, tell me about that. Yeah. The, 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 each station had anywhere between seven and nine surfmen is what they called them. There was a keeper who was in charge and he was often sometimes referred to as captain uh, as a title. And the surfmen were ranked one through nine or whatever. If you were number one, you were second in command behind the keeper. If you were number nine, you were probably fishing or farming a couple of weeks ago. So that's the, um, that's the difference. It varied in, on experience and all that. So every night between August and June, during the summer, they didn't have as many people on. They would have somebody watching in the tower at each one of these stations. They would also send out a surfman to the south mm -hmm. and a surfman to the north. Mm -hmm. And they would often meet up with a surfman from another station at these halfway houses. And this is where they completed their, and there was also a place where they'd go in and keep warm. And uh, they also had a phone system, believe it or not. Uh, that went between all the different stations. Right. And the phone system, the phones were in the halfway house, so that helped them contact uh, the station if there was a problem. Right. And so with, with that going on, they walked anywhere, you know, four to six miles on these patrols. This was a long thing. And they, they had to go out sometimes in really bad weather. They always had to go out at night. They sometimes went out during the day if the weather was bad if it was foggy or if it was stormy or whatever so they had to go out keep an eye out for any ships that were in distress even if they saw one that looked like it might be in, in trouble they would alert somebody else down the line that oh we're somebody else is, somebody's in trouble out there be ready and often while they were going out if they sometimes they didn't see anything but if they were out in a storm and then they spotted somebody in trouble and that wasn't always easy to see, yeah. that's when they lit the flare, the Costin flare. And it's like what you might use along the road now if you're in trouble. But they would hold up the flare that would signal to the people out on the ship that helps on the way. And also it was a signal back to their station. Somebody up in the tower could see that a flare had been lit and time to send help down in that direction. This is when they are probably climbing up into the masts to avoid uh, you know, the ship breaking up or the waves that are coming over overboard, uh, washing things away. Sometimes, sometimes people on board the ships got washed away that way. 
so they had to act quickly and sometimes it wasn't fast enough, but a lot of times they got there in time mm -hmm. and they had a couple of different uh, rescue uh, methods. When they were coming down the beach uh, from the station, they had a surfboat that they also brought along, uh, whether they pushed it on a cart or had it pulled by a horse. Uh, that was one way. Uh, the surfboat was only used if they felt they could get out through the surf because the ship could be anywhere from 100 or 200 yards offshore to almost a mile. So if they could get through the surf on a surfboat, they would use that. Sometimes it was too treacherous. That's when they used something called the breeches buoy. And the breeches buoy was basically this, they established what was a zip line between the shore and the ship. And how did they attach that zip line? It was a little complicated, but they had uh, in their equipment, they had a little cannon, pretty small cannon called a Lyle gun. And the Lyle gun had a projectile in it and tied to the projectile would be this long cord, which was wrapped up in what they called a faking box. And the, the box had probably 500 yards worth of, of rope tied up in it. And this enabled them to tie this up, put the projectile in the Lyle gun and fire it out to the ship. And hopefully they would get the shot over the mast. And at that point, the people on board, if they're able to do it at this point, sometimes they weren't, uh, take it, fasten it up, follow the instructions. They actually had a board on it called a tally board that had instructions on how to fasten this thing. And it had a kind of a pulley system going on. And you were able to get into what looked like a pair of pants. And you stepped into that. And basically you went for a ride just above the waves, one at a time, sometimes two. Uh, but however they could get them across, they'd be pulled one at a time that way off the ship. And that's what they had to do on quite a few occasions. Did they use any sort of extra um, equipment or savings equipment to reach the disaster? One that you mentioned in the book, and actually it features on the cover of your book, the Castagna. Castagna involved, they tried both methods with the Castagna yeah. uh, of rescue. Ah. The Castagna happened in February... February 17th, 1914. Okay. And this was a, a vessel that was carrying a load of guano. Yeah. So this couldn't have been a very pleasant voyage. Uh, guano and cattle horns. It was, the ship was going, leaving South America, uh, Montevideo in Uruguay. Mm -hmm. and, and this was in December of 1913. Mm -hmm. And they were carrying this load headed north to Weymouth was their destination, just south of Boston, to the Bradley Fertilizer Company. So the Castagna uh, is headed north from South America over the equator and nobody, I don't know what they were thinking, but I don't know if they realized that you head north over the equator in December, you're asking for trouble. You're asking for winter weather. These men were not dressed for winter weather. They were still wearing summer attire. They didn't have any heavy clothes. Right. So as they're heading up over the equator and then particularly past the Tropic of Cancer through January and into February, they're hitting one storm after another. And the, storm, the Castagna is getting battered as it's going north. And it's going out along off Long Island and up towards Cape Cod. And by the time it gets up towards Cape Cod, it's really in trouble. It's got all kinds of holes in the ship and holes in the cabin and the men are freezing. They're in, they're in really bad shape. Everybody's in bad shape here. And then as it gets along Cape Cod, people at the Orleans life-saving station, the surf surfmen there spot it and they're issuing the warning to everybody else, keep an eye out for this one. It doesn't look like it's in very good shape. Okay. Finally, it hits a storm as it approaches the Cape. Mm -hmm. 
And this was, this was it for it. The Castagna couldn't handle it. It got driven into the sandbar just south of uh, where the Marconi station was in um, Wellfleet. Mm -hmm. And when it hit the bar at about early morning hours, so it's dark, it's about 10 degrees, snow and every other horrible frozen form of precipitation is falling. Right. And Windsor, you know, gale force at very least. Mm -hmm. And these poor men are in the worst shape. It hits the sandbar, the ship starts, you could hear it breaking apart. The surfmen on duty could hear it, you could hear the sh what sounded like gunshots going off. And the men had to take up to into the uh, mast. Surfman sees it, lights the flare, gets back to his station. Two stations answered the call, Nauset in East Ham and also Cahoon's Hollow. That's the site of what is now the beachcomber. Oh, yeah. And these two stations answered the call to get there. They can't get even get on the beach. They had to operate it first from up high and they can't do a surf boat rescue. They tried to do the uh, breaches buoy shooting the line out. Nobody on board was in good enough shape to handle it. So they had to kind of wait out the tide. When the tide finally gave in, uh, finally let it went out, they were able to get the surf boat out there. And that's when they saw horror of horrors. They get to the, they get to the uh, vessel and this involves some of the members of both stations. One of them was a fellow named Lewis Collins. Collins was the number one surfman. He had been there at Nauset for a long time. His son, Bernie, used to go with him to these wrecks. Even as a little kid, he was going with him to his wrecks. Well, at this point now, Bernie's 17 years old. And he's basically like, Dad, can I go to work with you? You know, and he went with them to this wreck. And they get out there and Bernie, being a little smaller in size was actually, it helped him able to get to places that maybe the surfman couldn't get to. So he was very good at doing this kind of thing. So they get out to the ship, they get on board and most of these men are pretty far gone. Um, they're, they're informed that men uh, that are up in the masts had died. They were frozen to death up in the masts. Bernie later told the story how one of them fell he was frozen solid, fell, and his arm broke off and shattered. I, I find it a little hard to believe, but it was quite a story. Anyway, they saw this scene, and also uh, many of these other men on board that are barely alive, uh, they were told that the captain had fallen from the mast, hit his head, and the impact probably killed him. But from there, instantly, he was washed overboard into the ocean. They didn't see his body again for a year and a half. It washed ashore at Nauset Marsh, wow. 10 miles away, and still very well preserved. They figured that he was probably buried in the sand right after the, he was washed overboard and then reemerged. Uh, that gives you an idea of the power yeah. of the ocean. Yeah, so such such a sad story. I mean, just amazing. And for that young man to see this has to have been just shocking. And, yeah. And Bernie, Bernie had to climb up in the masts and cut some of these frozen men down. Mm -hmm. uh, but he also encountered uh, the one man who was still alive, hunched over the wheel box, clutching on the spokes of the wheel. Right. And... They, Bernie had to cut the spoke with an ax to free the man because he, he was frozen to the spoke and the man, they got him ashore and he died on the way to being uh, to the um, Marconi station is where they brought him. Yeah. Uh, but he, he didn't survive. Uh, there were, so they took some of the survivors, so only a handful of men survived. They brought them to Boston uh, where they had to undergo amputations some of them because the frostbite was so bad. Bernie himself was severely affected by that. So there was, there was that, but there were some other survivors too. When they got inside the cabin afterwards, after they took care of the men, they went inside the cabin. This is where everybody should have probably gone because that held together somehow. And in the cabin, they went in, they found 
a canary in a cage still singing. The canary somehow survived that. He didn't survive going off the, uh, off the uh, he died oh, shortly okay. after. But also there was a cat and the cat they brought ashore and they, they named him Castagna after the ship. He they brought him to the Marconi station where it was rumored that he started a very long line of stray cats on the outer cape. <laughs> so Castagna the cat was one of the survivors of, of that tragedy. There's another storm that also stayed with you, and that is the Portland Gale. And I understand that that has kind of, as you were researching this, that really stuck with you so much so that it sounds like that's going to be your next book. A lot of people know it as the Portland Gale. It's known as the Portland Gale because of the uh, steamer Portland, which left Boston on the night of November 26th, 1898, as a storm was hitting. A storm that ended up being much more severe than anyone thought possible. And it was making its way up as the storm hit. It was driven out to sea. And eventually it went down over Stellwagen Bank area offshore. Um, and a lot of people thought it had wrecked off of Cape Cod originally. Um, it, that alone claimed an estimated 190 two lives yeah. and many of these about 30 or 35 or 40 of these bodies washed ashore on Cape Cod's outer beaches so this went on for several weeks that this well, was you don't, going on yeah you don't want to give away too much of this right because this is going to be the book that's coming sure up, right? but that, that's, that's pretty commonly known but also there were many other wrecks too yeah. uh in, in Provincetown and Chatham and uh, even out on Martha's Vineyard. So um, I'm taking a look into that as well. Well, I'm looking forward to it. That sounds like it's going to be a really good book. Um, and we can hear about this book and a lot of your other efforts um, through your website, which is, is really extensive. So tell us a little bit about what you can we can find on your website, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Yep, yeah, there's uh, you can can find a lot of my upcoming events, which uh, if it's lectures or if it's walks that I've led uh, out on the Outer Cape as well uh, at dwcapecod.com. Uh, there's a lot of other information there too, but uh, there's an events page and uh, that'll tell you what's going on. Fantastic. Very good, very good. And places also where we can where you, where we can buy your book. I know you have autographed copies of some of them at some spots, some of the independent booksellers on Cape Cod. So that's wonderful. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, several uh, also online as well. On the website has links to uh, buying it online. Yeah. Also. So I can definitely recommend to the audience that this is a really interesting book. You'll learn a lot about history and um, a lot about Cape Cod and obviously obviously a lot about the life-saving service efforts of, of the on the Outer Cape and of just some amazing people that tried to help in a really horrible, potentially horrible situations. So thank you so much for being here, Don. We really appreciate your, your time. No, well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Sure. And thanks to everyone for watching Books in the World. 